Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York Foreign Press Central Briefing with Department of State spokesperson Ned Price. Mr. Price will provide a readout of the UN General Assembly and take questions. We are so pleased to have him here today. This briefing is on the record. Following the spokesperson's opening remarks, I'll open the floor for questions. If you have a question, go to the participant field and raise your virtual hand and wait for me to call on you. When called on, Please enable both your audio and your video so the spokesperson can see you and continue seeing you as he's answering your question. Um, and with that, it's my to turn it over to spokesperson Price. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Daphne, for that introduction. I'm so pleased uh, to be here. Um, it is, in fact, a real pleasure to be here. This is my first uh, briefing at the FPC. Uh, I can assure you this will uh, not be my last, and I'm looking forward to speaking uh, with all of you. It's also an especially opportune time uh, to speak to all of you. This week, as you know, uh, Secretary Blinken participated in the UN General Assembly's high-level uh, week, the first uh, time since President Biden took office. This was an opportunity for the United States to show up, to listen, uh, and lead as we rally the world uh, to work together in tackling the most pressing challenges of our time. You heard President Biden call for relentless diplomacy, as he put it, and our State Department team, including the Secretary, including the Deputy Secretary, including uh, our Undersecretaries, uh, including our Assistant Secretaries, and many others across the Department have been doing just that. The Secretary, uh, during his time here in New York, had the opportunity to meet with partners and allies from around the world uh, for a wide range of bilateral and multilateral discussions. You've all seen the readouts by now, so I won't bore you by uh, rehashing all of them, uh, but I will note uh, that the secretary in the course of his several days here in New York uh, met with over, uh, engaged with counterparts from more than 60 countries in bilateral, regional, and multilateral settings. Uh, that includes meeting with the foreign ministers uh, from the UK, Brazil, Turkey, Egypt, France, Pakistan, the EU High Representative, uh, and the President of the DRC. Uh, among his multilateral engagements, we're meeting with counterparts from the P5, hosted by the UN Secretary General, uh, and with the C5 plus one. Uh, he met with foreign ministers from ASEAN nations, from the Gulf Cooperation Council, and with foreign ministers uh, from Mexico and Central America in his final meeting uh, here yesterday. The Secretary also participated in trilateral talks uh, with the Japanese and Korean foreign ministers on the margins of the General Assembly. In addition, Secretary Blinken participated in, min in a ministerial hosted on Libya, uh, in a ministerial on Libya hosted by France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, he had a productive discussion with G20 foreign ministers on Afghanistan, and he attended yesterday's UN Security Council me meeting on climate and security that you all saw. The Secretary also spoke at the Global COVID-19 Summit, which was hosted by the White House, uh, where he reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to fighting the virus, uh, both at home and around the world. All of these engagements are essential, in our view, because if we are to deliver for the American people uh, to confront the truly great challenges of our time, we have to work together. Uh, we have to work with the entire world, and that's exactly what you have seen us do, not only in the context of the UN General Assembly, uh, but also since our very first day uh, in office, when we have demonstrated a determined effort to revitalize our alliances and partnerships uh, around the world. We've reaffirmed our unshakable commitment to NATO, uh, and in particular to Article 5, as well as to the defense of our allies in East Asia. We're renewing, broadening, and deepening our engagement with the European Union, and we're elevating uh, the Quad partnership, uh, including with uh, what you will see today. Uh, we're re-engaging with regional institutions, and that includes ASEAN to the African Union uh, to the Organization of American States. But across all of our diplomatic engagements this week, two challenges really stood out above the rest. And you heard Secretary Blinken uh, discuss these in a bit of detail yesterday, but that was really COVID-19 and the climate crisis. Uh, in terms of the former, COVID-19, uh, you heard the president announce new commitments the United States is making to end the pandemic, and that includes purchasing half a billion additional doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, that is half a billion with a B. That brings the total number of doses 
uh, the United States will donate to more than 1.1 billion. Again, billion with a B. We're working with countries around the world to vaccinate billions of people taking bold steps to save lives and building back better to prevent the next epidemic. Uh, we know that if we are to keep the American people safe at home, if people are to be safe uh, anywhere uh, from this virus, people need to be vaccinated and to be safe everywhere uh, from uh, the scourge of COVID-19. On tackling the climate change, uh, we are only weeks away from the COP26 summit, and you heard the Secretary very clearly state that every nation will need to come to the table with their highest possible ambitions. Uh, we must achieve that if we are uh, to keep within reach the essential goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Secretary also had several opportunities, both bilaterally and multilaterally, to make the point that all the countries and organizations represented here this week in New York have a shared interest uh, in a stable and secure Afghanistan. And together, we must stay united in holding the Taliban to their commitments in key areas. And we've outlined five of those. First, we must hold the Taliban to their commitment to allow foreign nationals and Afghans to travel outside the country if they so choose. The United States support, supports the safe departure of Afghans who wish to leave, and we support our partners in their efforts to relocate Afghan staff and family members. We believe this should be a prerequisite to any meaningful engagement with the Taliban. Second, we must hold the Taliban accountable to their commitment to prevent terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a base for external operations uh, that threaten other countries. Third, we must be fierce advocates for the human rights of all Afghan people. And of course, that includes uh, the women, the children, uh, members of minority groups in Afghanistan. And the Taliban must make good on their commitment not to carry out reprisal violence and to grant amnesty to all who work for the former government or co coalition forces. Fourth, we must keep pressing the Taliban on unimpeded humanitarian access. And you've heard from the United States, you've heard from a number of countries around the world uh, about our humanitarian commitment, our enduring humanitarian commitment uh, to the people of Afghanistan. And finally, we've called on the Taliban to form an inclusive government and a government that can meet the needs and reflect the aspirations of the Afghan people. So it was a lot of business that we were able to accomplish uh, here in New York over the course uh, of this week, but uh, the diplomacy uh, does not end here. Uh, high level week may be ending, uh, but that relentless diplomacy, as the president said, uh, will continue. And with that, I uh, look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. Um, if you have a question, please reach your, re excuse me, re raise your virtual hand, uh, wait for me to call on you. Please identify by yourself and your outlet and enable your video and audio. Um, let's go to the first question to Ben Marks. Yeah, uh, hi, Ned, nice to see you. Thank you for doing hey, ben, good uh, to meet you. Yeah, um, I have a question on the CPTPP. Uh, both uh, China and Taiwan have formally applied to join. Uh, could I first get your comment on this? And I'd like to know if the U.S. is considering going back to consultations about joining the CPTPP. And then finally, uh, several uh, parties to the CPTPP uh, were in meetings with the secretary during this week. So did the issue come up at all in any of his meetings? Thank you. Uh Thanks for that, Ben. So you raised uh, the issue of both China uh, and Taiwan raising their hands and submitting uh, a request to join the CPTPP. Uh, we are not a party to the CPTPP. Uh, therefore, we defer to uh, those uh, countries that are parties regarding uh, their views on uh, the accession of any uh, would-be uh, entrant. Uh, when it comes to China, uh, we would expect that China's non-market trade practices and China's use of economic coercion against other countries uh, would factor into the CPTPP's party's uh, evaluation as a potential uh, candidate for accession. Uh, similarly, uh, we would expect that Taiwan's record as a responsible member of the World Trade Organization and Taiwan's strong embrace of democratic values uh, would factor into the CPT CPTPP's party's evaluation of Taiwan as a potential candidate for accession. Uh, but uh, of course, um, those are decisions that 
uh, need to be made by the member states. Uh, when it comes to the United States, uh, we have uh, addressed this on several occasions, including uh, recently from uh, the White House. Uh, the president has been clear uh, that he would not rejoin the, P the TPP as it was initially put forward. Uh, much has changed in the world since TPP was signed in 2016. Uh, this administration is reviewing CPTPP to evaluate its consist consistency with our Build Back Better agenda. Uh, we want to work with Congress to negotiate and develop trade policies that advance the interests of all Americans, support U.S. innovation, and enhance our competitiveness. And in the midst of all of that, uh, you have heard from uh, the White House uh, and others that uh, our first task is to make the investments at home uh, that will make us more competitive on the world stage, uh, that will uh, allow the American people uh, to um, take advantage uh, of uh, global commerce uh, in a way that uh, redounds and rewards uh, our economy um, for its vibrancy uh, and the American people for their creativity uh, and ingenuity. And so that agenda is well underway. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question will go to uh, Jan Ellen. Please enable your audio and video and identify your outlet, please. Okay. Yeah, hi. I'm from Turkish Journal and um, I cover Turkey and the world. I want to ask um, how important is Turkey's role in the situation with Afghanistan? considering that Turkey is um, involved in the security of the airport, but how, in, how important is Turkey's role to the U.S. in diplomacy? And the other question on Afghanistan is that obviously the Taliban, as you know from many eyewitnesses, have not kept their commitments, and I don't see how you can think to engage. I mean, I know you want to engage with them, but how can you trust the engagement to be real for humanitarian aid and women and girls if you could answer that, but especially about the Turkey question, I would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for that question. As you know, uh, Turkey is an import, important NATO ally. We've worked closely uh, with uh, our Turkish allies across a number of challenges, uh, and that includes in the context of Afghanistan. Uh, Turkey is uh, and has long played uh, an important role in Afghanistan. Most recently, uh, they are uh, working closely with our Qatari partners. Uh, in the context of Kabul International Airport uh, and doing incredibly important work to see to it that the airport can be operational in the first instance, uh, allowing for a limited uh, set of charter flights, uh, charter flights that have been able to facilitate the departure of American citizens, of LPRs, uh, of lawful president, uh, permanent residents, that is to say, uh, and, other, and others uh, who wish to leave. Uh, with an eye towards reopening the airport to regular uh, and more regularized commercial traffic um, going forward. That is an important task. It's an important task for a number of reasons. Uh, one, for the ability um, uh, of those who wish to depart Afghanistan uh, to do so. And when the Taliban have uh, made public and private commitments to safe passage, a functioning airport and a functioning commercial airport in the form of Kabul International Airport is an important instrument in that regard. Uh, but this also gets to you an element, uh, the second element of your question, uh, a functioning international airport is, is important for the provision of humanitarian aid uh, to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and that is something that we are deeply committed to. Uh, the United States has um, contributed billions of dollars to the people of Afghanistan over the past 20 years, about $4 billion uh, since 2002. Uh, this year alone, we have put forward $330 million in humanitarian assistance for the people of Afghanistan, uh, including uh, an additional $64 million uh, in recent weeks. And importantly, this is humanitarian assistance. Uh, this is assistance that will uh, help uh, and provide uh, relief to the people of Afghanistan, to uh, the women, to the girls, uh, to minorities, uh, to all those uh, who may be uh, in need of it. Um, this is, uh, of course, separate uh, from any bilateral assistance uh, that the United States provided to uh, the uh, former government. Uh, this is only about helping uh, the Afghan people. 
Uh, we believe that uh, we can continue to provide this humanitarian aid uh, without it flowing through uh, the Taliban uh, or any other uh, entity. Uh, this is uh, something we have done in any number of contexts around the world, working directly with our operating partners on the ground uh, so that they can dispense uh, with this assistance uh, as appropriate to the Afghan people. We've been in regular touch with our operating partners uh, and we're confident that we can continue to provide uh, this humanitarian assistance going forward. In terms of our engagement uh, with the Taliban, uh, there is, uh, we, we have been, as have uh, many countries, engaging uh, with the Taliban on issues uh, that are paramount to our national interest. Uh, and of course, those have been very uh, narrow and limited in scope to date. Uh, first and foremost, it has been, uh, this engagement has been predicated uh, on the ability of American citizens, of lawful permanent residents, uh, of uh, Afghans who have uh, worked with and for the United States over the course of 20 years uh, to depart the country uh, if they so choose. It is manifestly in our interest uh, to engage uh, in these um, uh, these types of discussions uh, with the Taliban uh, and a number of countries uh, are doing so uh, in a way that is limited, narrow, uh, and uh, appropriate. When it comes to any broader engagement, uh, that is something where uh, we will look not to what the Taliban say, uh, not to what they profess, but uh, to what they do. Uh, and um, we, together with the international community, have made clear uh, that there are a number of metrics and benchmarks uh, and expectations uh, of the Taliban, um, uh, the important of which were spelled out in a UN Security Council resolution uh, that uh, the uh, international community uh, put forward. Uh, and importantly, because those commitments are enshrined in a UN Security Council resolution, it gives us uh, another important tool to hold the Taliban to account, should they not live up to those international commitments? Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. The next question will go to um, Mushkafil. Can you please uh, unmute yourself and? Thank you. Thank. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Thank you, Ned. Nice to have you in this press briefing. So Good to see you. on on Bangladesh, you know, more than ten human rights organizations ask U.S. and the U.N for decisive action these because the country's law and forces agency and the the government is violating human rights extremely extrajudicial killing is going on and as you know press freedom is very much controlled and very disappointing piece of that that the bangladesh regime organized a press conference in new york and just one of our colleague asked a simple question why hundred bangladesh prime minister leading 141 delegation in this pandemic time where the other country is leading very small. Then they attacked brutally. He was in hospitalized and released from the Almost Hospital. It, you know, the USA is a, is a first amendment, it is a free press, is established already. But the other country where they are coming for the press briefing and they are attacking journalists. So it is very, I don't know, I'm, what is your reaction on that? And what is your uh, reaction about the 10 human rights organization like Human Rights Watch, Robert Kennedy Human Rights, the, wrote a letter to you and UN for decisive action for this extreme violation of human rights. Thank you very much. Good to see you. I believe you and I had an opportunity to discuss this issue a couple months ago uh, now, but uh, we continue to be deeply concerned uh, over increasing reports of suppression and intimidation of journalists in Bangladesh. Uh, and that includes under the Digital Security Act, uh, a law that suppresses and actually criminalizes uh, freedom of expression. Press freedom and access to factual and accurate information are found uh, foundational to prosperous and secure democratic societies. Uh, that is true the world over. We condemn the use of harassment or intimidation to restrict the ability of independent journalists to serve the public uh, wherever it may occur. And we call on governments to ensure media safety and to project, protect journalists' ability to do their jobs without fear of violence, threats, uh, or unjust detention. When it comes to the incident uh, in New York City this week that you raised, we're aware of reports of an alleged assault against a Bangladeshi journalist at an event located in New York. Uh, we would need to refer you to the New York Metropolitan Police Department for further information on that. Good to see you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. The next question will go to Owen Churchill from the South China Morning Post. Please go ahead. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Thanks, Ned. Thanks a lot for doing this. Um, a couple of questions. So on Wednesday, um, the Chinese ambassador to the US, Qing Gang, he said that he, he re reiterated the point from Beijing that um, they were not willing to engage in, in collaboration and cooperation with the US on things like climate change um, while the US was um, confronting China on other fronts. Um, and I was just curious whether either this week at the UNGA or in general, you'd seen any evidence to either support the, that idea or refute that idea that, that China was holding back on cooperation with the US um, on climate change while the US is, you know, pursuing these other these other points of competition and confrontation with Beijing. Um, and secondly, a, a finer point, he also said that Beijing would happily reopen the consulate in Chengdu as soon as the US reopened the um, Houston consulate. So I just wanted to get an update on the administration's consideration of that, whether, whether you're consideration, considering reopening the consulate in Houston. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks for that question, Owen. Good to see you. Uh, when it comes to climate, uh, we are committed to working with countries around the world uh, on climate as an urgent priority. Uh, and of course, uh, we are seeking and committed uh, to working with the PRC on climate. It's especially important that we do so, uh, given that the PRC is the world's largest emitter by uh, a long shot. We know that the world cannot successfully address the climate challenge without significant additional action by the PRC. Uh, their emissions, I think, represent about 30% uh, of the global total, uh, in addition to their carbon intensive uh, investments abroad. Uh, we need the PRC and the United States to succeed in slashing emissions uh, if we are to reach that uh, Paris Agreement temperature goal and to, as I said before, limit global warming uh, uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels uh, to keep that limit within reach. Uh, we can do this by identifying specific ambitious near-term emissions reductions goals, backing them up with serious policy uh, and working together uh, to show the world uh, that uh, where we need to go uh, and how we need to get there. As you know, the secretary took part uh, in uh, a meeting uh, with many of his counterparts this week uh, focused on this very issue. Uh, and we have uh, continued to work with a number of countries and Secretary Kerry was uh, not all that long ago in Tianjin uh, where he had extended conversations uh, with some of his PRC counterparts um, about this. But the United States has uh, put forward ambitious goals uh, and we continue to uh, work with our um, partners uh, around the world uh, to encourage them to put forward similarly ambitious goals uh, because we know that, uh, quite frankly, we don't have a choice. Uh, this is something that uh, we must do. And I use the we collectively here uh, to refer to the United States uh, and uh, the rest of the international community, especially those countries uh, that are responsible for a great share of the world's emissions. Thanks, Owen. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this question was pre-submitted um, by a young duck from Yonghak uh, News Agency. Uh, he asks, South, the South Korean president proposed South Korea, the US and North Korea declare a formal end to the Korean War as a starting point of North Korea's denuclearization process. While the US says it is committed to engaging with North Korea, it appears to disagree with President Moon that such a declaration could mark the start of the denuclearization process. So my question is, does the US believe a declaration of formal end of the Korean War can and should be made? More precisely, does it believe that the declaration can be made at the top of the denuclearization negotiations or should it wait until the North completely denuclearizes first? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, look, we remain committed uh, to achieving lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and we believe the best way to do that is through dialogue uh, and diplomacy with the DPRK. Uh, we will continue to seek engagement with the DPRK as part of a calibrated practical approach uh, in order to make tangible progress that increases the security, not only for uh, the United States, but also for uh, our allies in the region, our deployed forces and our partners as well. We've said this uh, a number of times now, but we have no hostile intent towards the DPRK. 
uh, and we are prepared to meet with the DPRK without preconditions. Uh, we hope the DPRK will respond uh, positively to our outreach. In the meantime, you have seen us do a lot of concerted work, quite a bit of spade work uh, with uh, our allies and partners. And just uh, this week, Secretary Blinken uh, held another trilateral engagement uh, with his uh, ROK and Japanese counterparts. And one of the uh, primary topics of discussion uh, in that uh, trilateral engagement uh, was uh, a, um, uh, a common approach uh, towards the DPRK, knowing that uh, if we are to be effective, uh, we need to continue to be and to work in lockstep uh, with our partners in the ROK uh, and in Japan. Uh, when it comes to relations between uh, the ROK and the DPRK, uh, we continue to believe that uh, uh, inter-Korean uh, dialogue uh, and engagement is uh, a good thing, uh, and we continue to work closely uh, with our ROK allies uh, on the broader agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. The next question will go to um, Amrai. Amrai, please enable your video and uh, identify your outlet and your full name, please. Hey, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so I'm Amrai Cohen. I'm the US correspondent with the German weekly newspaper Die Zeit. Uh, thank you very much for this meeting. So after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and after the Australia, UK, US submarine deal, the EU feels a little bit uh, left out, I guess, or in the case of France, even betrayed by the US. So my question is, what is the transatlantic relationship still worth? And can the EU still rely on the US as an ally? Uh, well, thank you for uh, that question. Let me let me start with uh, the first uh, element of it. As you know, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, yesterday it was had an opportunity to meet uh, directly with his uh, French counterpart, Foreign Minister Le Drian, uh, here in New York City, uh, and uh, that was after they've been in several meetings together uh, during the course of our high level week engagements on uh, at the UN and on the margins uh, of the General Assembly. Uh, the secretary has a long uh, friendship uh, with the foreign minister. He is someone uh, the secretary holds uh, in, in high regard. Uh, the secretary's meeting yesterday uh, followed the president's discussion with President Macron uh, the previous day. Uh, we agreed, and the president communicated this directly to President Macron, that the September, September 15th announcement uh, would have benefited from uh, open consultations among allies. Uh, and President Macron and uh, President Biden and uh, Foreign Minister Le Drian and uh, Secretary Blinken uh, have um, now put in place a process of in-depth consultations going forward. Uh, look, we, we recognize uh, this will take time uh, and hard work uh, that needs to be demonstrated not only uh, in words and readouts, uh, but also in deeds. Uh, to make clear uh, the priority we attach to the bilateral relationship uh, we have uh, with France, uh, but also uh, the relationship we have uh, with the EU ha as a whole. Uh, we recognize that the transatlantic alliance has fostered security, uh, stability, and prosperity uh, around the world for more than seven decades. And our commitment to those bonds and this work together uh, is very much unwavering. Uh, we welcome uh, the broader trend of European countries playing an important role in the Indo-Pacific. And in fact, uh, the EU several days ago released uh, its own Pacific strategy, which France uh, had uh, a heavy hand in helping to craft. And that is something uh, that we very warmly welcome, knowing that our own uh, interests, our own objectives and goals uh, in the Indo-Pacific region can only be achieved uh, if we work uh, hand in glove uh, with our allies and partners around the world. That includes our allies uh, in Europe, it includes our allies uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region um, as well. Um, we know when it comes to uh, France, when it comes to the EU, um, uh, we uh, will continue to have strong relations, uh, but we also know we can do more uh, and we can uh, do better uh, in a few specific areas. Um, as I said before, we'll look to deepen that engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the EU strategy is um, complementary uh, to our own uh, agenda, to our own strategy. 
uh, and you'll hear more about uh, that, uh, our own uh, revised strategy in the months ahead. Uh, it will, in fact, be informed by what the EU has done uh, in France's role uh, in the region as well. In the Sahel uh, is another region where uh, we stand to benefit greatly uh, from our cooperation with uh, our French allies and from our, our European partners uh, more broadly. We're already working very closely with France uh, in that region uh, against terrorism. Uh, France recently announced a remarkable achievement uh, in eliminating uh, a senior terrorist leader, Abu Alif, uh, from the battlefield. This is someone who had uh, American blood uh, on his hands uh, and French blood uh, on his hands uh, as well. Um, and finally, on transatlantic security, um, we uh, very much support France's efforts to strengthen European security and defense capacity uh, in conformity uh, with NATO. I've already spoken to our commitment to NATO. In fact, uh, the sacrosanct status uh, that we attach to Article uh, 5. Uh, but we know it's in our interest and in Europe's interest for Europe's capacities to be strengthened uh, further. And we'll be talking about this as we go forward. Uh, and we'll be talking about this uh, with our European allies uh, and with France in particular. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Chair. We have time for one more question and that question will go to Seema Sarohi of the Economic Times. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you, Ned. Uh, the question I have is about Afghanistan and one about the Indo-Pacific. On Afghanistan, um, is there any move uh, from the Biden administration to recognize the government anytime soon? And about the delisting of the um, terrorists, of, of the Haqqanis who, who are now part of the government, and how much coordination are you doing with other countries, such as India, that is going to be directly impacted by this? My, my question on the Indo-Pacific is, there's some, there's some a bit of heartache in parts of the Indian strategic community that this was technology that India sort of desperately wanted and had asked for the US completely denied it. And now uh, in the views of these people, the Indo Pacific, the quad form, uh, you know, formation uh, kind of loses uh, a bit of fizz. And um, because of AUKUS, the new security alliance. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you for those questions. Uh, when it comes to our approach to Afghanistan, uh, I, I would hasten to add it is not our approach. Uh, it is approach that you have heard echoed uh, and codified uh, by much of the international community. Uh, it was an approach that was put forward uh, in a binding UN Security Council resolution. It's an approach that's been put forward uh, in a statement that more than 100 countries have signed on to. Uh, and on the other side of the ledger, it's an approach that the Taliban uh, have told us both privately and publicly uh, that uh, their actions would be consistent with. And so in my opening remarks, I spoke of uh, really five key expectations that the United States and the international community has for uh, the next government of Afghanistan. Uh, number one, allowing foreign nationals uh, and Afghans to travel outside the country if they choose to do so. Two, preventing terrorist groups from using Afghanistan uh, as a base for attacks against other countries. Uh, three, respecting basic human rights, and that includes, of course, the rights of women, of girls, uh, of Afghanistan's minorities. Four, uh, allowing unimpeded humanitarian access so that uh, the humanitarian relief that the United States and our partners are delivering uh, to the Afghan people uh, can, in fact, reach the Afghan people. And, and fifth and finally, forming a genuinely inclusive government uh, that uh, meets the basic needs and is representative uh, of the people that the next government of Afghanistan uh, purports to lead. Uh, again, those are not conditions that the United States has put forward unilaterally. Uh, these are conditions that much of the international community uh, has signed on to uh, in different ways and in different forms and in different statements. Um, this is the international community speaking with one voice. And we heard that by and large this week uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, there was uh, a ministerial uh, on the part of uh, the group of 20 nations, the G20 this week, uh, that was focused on Afghanistan 
uh, where these same key themes were put forward. Uh, there were any other number of bilateral uh, and multilateral engagements uh, that we took part in uh, where uh, these same expectations uh, uh, were made uh, loud uh, and clear. And so our engagement, as I said before, with the Taliban right now is focused narrowly and exclusively uh, on our key national interests. And right now, paramount uh, to us is the ability of our citizens uh, and those with whom we've worked over the past 20 years to depart the country if they choose to do so. Uh, our relationship um, with the Taliban, with any future government of Afghanistan, uh, will, um, of course, be contoured uh, to the actions uh, of the Taliban and to any future uh, government uh, and will conform uh, with any future government's ability, willingness, and success in complying uh, with those uh, basic uh, frameworks. Uh, when it comes to the Haqqani network, uh, this gets uh, back to the issue of the caretaker cabinet uh, that the Taliban uh, has put forward. Um, the Haqqani network in our system is designated as a foreign terrorist organization. I can assure you uh, that any engagements uh, that we have with the Taliban uh, will be conducted consistent uh, with the U.S. law and to advance U.S. national security goals. Uh, and as I said before, um, paramount among those goals right now uh, is uh, the willingness on the part of the Taliban uh, to allow uh, freedom of movement, freedom of travel uh, to American citizens and to others uh, who wish to leave uh, Afghanistan should they uh, choose to do so. When it comes to uh, India and when it comes to uh, the Quad, this is uh, an especially opportune time to, to ask that question. I believe uh, right now, in fact, uh, the President Biden and the administration uh, is meeting uh, with uh, members of uh, the Quad at the White House. Uh, we believe the Quad is an essential multilateral grouping that convenes for like-minded democracies, United States, Australia, Japan, and India, uh, to coordinate in the Indo-Pacific, uh, ensuring our collective commitment to peace, to security, to prosperity uh, in the region and, and beyond. Uh, and so the Quad leaders today will be focused on deepening our ties and advancing practical uh, cooperation in a number of different areas, included among those areas, uh, COVID-19. And we announced earlier this year a manufacturing uh, uh, arrangement with uh, the Quad that will be key to helping us uh, defeat this pandemic around the world addressing the climate crisis, and we've talked about this already uh, in the context of, of this briefing, um, partnering on emerging, emer emerging technologies and, and cyberspace, uh, promoting high standards, uh, uh, promoting high standards infrastructure, and uh, the broadest of all, uh, promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, hosting of these leaders today is just the latest uh, indication of the priority we attach uh, to this multilateral grouping. Uh, as you know, there was a virtual uh, Quad Leader Summit earlier this year. This will be the first time uh, the leaders, uh, all four of them, meet in person in the context uh, of the Quad. Secretary Blinken has also engaged his Quad counterparts uh, at the ministerial uh, level. The Quad, as you know, is, is one uh, multilateral grouping. grouping. We've talked about uh, our system of partners and alliances uh, around the world. Uh, the Quad is not intended to replace or supplant uh, any other multilateral grouping. We know uh, that each and every one of our allies, each and every one of our partners, each and every one uh, of the multilateral uh, fora uh, in which we engage uh, are incredibly important uh, to our goals. Uh, and uh, chief among those goals is the promotion and the protection uh, of the rules-based international order. Uh, that the United States and our partners have helped to build uh, uh, and protect over the past uh, seven decades. So with that, I want to thank you all very much. And again, I look forward to doing this again soon. Uh, thank you to the FPC for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, that concludes today's briefing. As a reminder, uh, today's briefing was on the record and we will share a transcript with, uh, with everyone who joined us today as well as posted on our website afterwards. Good afternoon.